So as I was saying, the last one describes uh, the current day situation. So in the current day ones, which we'll see later, the um, builder of the temple, Suribarman II, is imposed in, into these myths and, and uh, stories. Now, the reason for that is twofold. Uh, the, obviously, the king wants to uh, say, hey, I'm the dude in charge and I'm the guy keeping the peace. But that's also a Hindu theme that resonates uh, throughout all these stories. And the, the theme being that um, there's disorder in the world and uh, the gods are constantly struggling against these forces, forces of nature, which they uh, represent as demons. And, um, and they're trying to describe the world around them. They're trying to describe uh, how these things happen. So as um, the Hindu uh, religion and mythology um, developed, they um, took on these personifications of gods and demons and, and all that. But they're really just three gods you have to know about, Brahma, Dev, uh, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma's uh, kind of um, the description of nature. He, he, he she is just uh, describing the way the world is. And the, you can come to Brahma for advice and uh, he'll say, oh, you know, hey, you can do this, you can do that, it's up to you. Uh, so Vishnu and Shiva both go to him. So now, as I was saying, Angkor Wat is a westward facing temple. So that's um, the, um, the, the facing toward death and, and whatnot. Or Shiva is an eastward facing temple and that's um, birth and creation and those sorts of things. If, if you're going to uh, go to a Hindu temple dedicated to Shiva, you would walk you would walk up to the temple from the east, and then you would walk around it one time in a clockwise direction before entering. Um, but Vishnu, you would do just the opposite. You would enter and go in a counterclockwise position. Now the Hindus also divided the world into four time periods, or yogas as they're called. And um, the earliest time period is where the churning of the sea of milk comes from. And you'll read maybe that they said it's a creation myth. It's not really a creation myth. The world has already been created when this event happens. And uh, the event is the search for um, health and freedom from sickness and disease and uh, keeping your youthful vigor. So it's it's the search for immortality. And the way that that comes about, the way that you get immortality, is by getting the um, elixir of, uh, of immortality. And in the story, and there are several different stories because you have to realize that the Hindu myths were created over hundreds of years, at least 600 years. So there are two great, um, mythic traditions, kind of like the Iliad and the Odyssey sort of stuff, but, uh, or, or like the um, Egyptian tales of the, um, the plagues that beset Egypt. In the Egyptian tales, the, the plagues are all, uh, can be traced to naturally occurring events, but they probably didn't all happen at one time. Um, it, it, they're trying to describe events that happen and then they compress them into the story of you know, well, first the locust came and then the river ran red, which it can do in the Nile. There's a particular kind of uh, bioagent that can make it turn red. So all these things can be described in some way. Um, and so here in the Hindu tale, and there are different versions of it, depending on which um, uh, ancient Hindu story you, you hear. But in the basic idea is that uh, they are churning the, the world um, to create the um, magic potion, the, the elixir that will give them immortality. And to do this, everything must be sacrificed. All life, mountains, oceans, everything. 
and, and nothing is off the table in terms of what you can do to get uh, deception, intrigue, um, it, it's all there. And, and the reason for this, and the reason why they stress this kind of an idea is that in the Hindu tale, the whole purpose of the gods is to create harmony and order against the disorder and um, chaos that nature can present. And the king is a representation of the gods on earth. And uh, so the king's job is to keep order and harmony. So that's why in the later things you'll see uh, the king in, in the epic tales to create um, um, harmony. So when you churn butter, think of those big old buckets you saw with a handle sticking out of it and there's a paddle inside of that bucket and there's a little top that's put on the bucket and then you, you, you churn that, um, that hand up by twisting it back and forth and typically you put a rope around it and so you have uh, people on either side pulling on the rope back and forth to churn what's going on. Well, in this tale, that's exactly what they do except they uproot a mountain and um, then uh, Vishnu sits atop the mountain and here's a, a picture of Vishnu sitting atop the mountain and it's sculpted in a very interesting way. His his, from the waist up, he, his back is to you, but from the waist down, his front is to you. Or is it the other way? Oh, it's, yeah. So, anyway, he is the uh, person holding the churn, and, and what is being churned is a mountain. So they uprooted a mountain, and the mountain, you don't really see, they never finished that, because I guess they didn't quite know how to do it. And then the bottom of the mountain is resting on a turtle shell. Now, I think that's very interesting because the Mayans used the idea of a turtle or a turtle shell cracking open to be the idea of that's where life uh, comes from, that's where creation um, is, is started. So what did they use for a rope? They used a giant snake. So in one end, you can see here the snake and there's a giant god, and that's actually Vishnu, and Vishnu in a certain, as they call it, personification. Actually, Vishnu can be all the gods, any of the gods and various things. And in, on this end of the rope are all the demons, and notice all the demons look exactly the same. And the idea of the demons and their chaos is to make everything the same. Interesting idea. And on the other end of the tail is, are the uh, uh, gods, and uh, they're being uh, whipped into action by Vishnu as a m monkey king. And he's using the tail to fan the uh, gods to keep them cool. Meanwhile, the uh, head of the snake, the uh, seven or nine headed Naga, is breathing out fire and, and so is destroying the world and making the, uh, um, the demons hot and sweaty and um, at the other end, uh, Vishnu in that personification as the monkey king is, is trying to keep them all cool. Everything gets destroyed. The, um, the fish in the sea you'll see down below are churned and eaten up in this churning. And eventually the salt water turns to milk and eventually out of the milk comes this pot, this elixir. And the demons get it, but they get tricked by, uh, uh, into giving up the, the milk because a beautiful woman comes and uh, it's uh, Vishnu or Shiva or Brahma, so one of those guys, I can't remember, comes and uh, steals the pot away and gives it to the gods so the gods become immortal. So that's the story of the churning of the sea of milk. And we're going to go see it today. And that's just one of eight panels. And so now, because it's Vishnu, we're going to start in the back corner, so the southeast corner. And from there, we're going to walk in a counterclockwise direction, and we're going to look at the other seven panels that are all part of the Hindu uh, mythic tradition. Now, to understand these myths, they're not showing you um, a progression of events, really. They are showing you um, specific 
places in time. And they don't all happen at the same time. They may happen over hundreds of thousands of years or, or whatnot. So they each have a kind of a, um, a particular tale to tell and we'll, we'll look at all that. Okay, boys and girls, that's all for now.